Philippa, good morning. Good morning. Very excited to uh, speak to you today. Um, it's my second time meeting you in person. And for the audience listening, Philippa is a chartered physiotherapist, a certified yoga instructor, and a certified uh, Pilates instructor. So I think I want to start, if I'm being selfish, by speaking to you about yoga, because... I'm about five months into my personal yoga journey. Um, I've spoken about this in previous podcasts, especially when we interviewed a, a another yoga instructor. Um, and so I was picking his brain, but it's something that I definitely undervalued, underestimated and judged um, and was very ignorant to, still am ignorant to, but discovering it. Um, so what's, yeah, tell me about your yoga journey. When did that begin for you? Um, and I also want to um, ask you why specifically Hatha yoga? Um, well, my yoga journey began about 10 years ago when I returned from the States and uh, I started to experience symptoms of perimenopause and sleeplessness was one of those things that I was experiencing. And so uh, I had a friend who was a yoga teacher and I went along and did some sessions with her because I came to understand that meditative practices like yoga uh, can contribute to uh, a restful night's sleep. So that was something that I uh, had I had, had explored it in my earlier uh, life, movement uh, career, if you like. Um, and a little bit like you, uh, it, you know, I felt it wasn't dynamic enough or uh, maybe just didn't quite get the point of it at that moment in time. And so it was me returning to yoga and, uh, and I just fell in love with the, uh, the holistic uh, practice that is, you know, in the, in the whole sense of the word, uh, we're connecting the mind, the body, the spirit, and we're moving at the same time. And you can really get lost in yoga. And, and I absolutely love that about it. And Hatha yoga. So I, I do, I practice Ashtanga and I mm. practice Vinyasa. Mm. My studio offers more mm. options but not Hatha. So where, do, where does Hatha come in? What, and what, what is... Um... Well, now, Danny, you're asking me, aren't you? But uh, Hatha Yoga, basically, I wanted to do a training and I didn't want to travel to the ends of the earth to do it. And so it just so happened that there was a teacher in my local vicinity and he was offering Hatha Yoga training. And I think Hatha Yoga is one of the most common uh, practices that you can uh, experience. And so for me, it was really just an opportunity to, to learn something that was related to yoga, that was a yoga practice. And I didn't really have an agenda, to be honest. Uh, I practiced something called forest yoga. And I know that Ashtanga and Vinyasa are both uh, quite vigorous practices. And Hatha is something that offers a little bit more in the way of uh, uh, opportunities to sustain postures and maybe hold a posture for longer and inhabit a posture. But by the same token, we can string postures together and turn it into a vinyasa flow. So I kind of felt that Hatha offered me the opportunity to get a certification, to become a teacher and just really continue on my journey of developing. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really open to lots of different movement experiences. And then actually this year, I'm hoping to try aerial yoga. That's on my list of things to try. So, um, you know, I try not to get too deep into, you know, the, the detail around this and think more about what do I want to transmit to the people that I work with in terms of movement? What movements do I want them to experience? If I want them to experience thoracic extension, then maybe we'll do a baby cobra. Perhaps we'll do um, an Anjianasana, a, a, a kneeling lunge, you know? So uh, that's really how I approach yoga. And, and so, you know, the meditation is something that I'm still relatively new to. And 
And, you know, learning is just my reason for being, my raison d'etre, <laughs> as they would say. And movement mm. is the core of your of what you preach. It right? absolutely is at the center of everything that I do, yes. Menopause. Oh. <laughs> Can you explain what menopause is? Well, I, I know it's a very, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big one, but to someone who, who doesn't know, obviously hasn't experienced it. No, um, and obviously, nor are you ever going to yourself. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know any, really much about it. Um, and I'm sure there are maybe many therapists out there that males or females that haven't experienced it mm. that don't know enough about it. Mm. I mean, this has been my journey over the last couple of years, really, delving deep into all the ramifications that menopause uh, wreaks on a woman's body. And, um, and so menopause is really the time when your periods stop. It's the end of the reproductive cycle. And for most uh, women, that will be around the age of 50, 51 in the Western world anyway. And, uh, but what is kind of came as a revelation to me, you know, and probably it shouldn't have, but it did, was that we can start to experience the fluctuating hormones from, uh, you know, our early 40s even. And so our bodies are changing and uh, symptoms, there's a, a huge list of symptoms that women can experience. And, uh, and, and that is uh, physical symptoms, psychological, emotional symptoms. And uh, the list, you know, there's over 34 of those symptoms on that list. And uh, Do most women experience at least some of the symptoms? Most women will experience at least some. 25% of women will have severe symptoms. And so that is, uh, it can range from hot flushes is a common symptom that mo many people will be familiar with. But uh, insomnia, sleeplessness, that was the thing that I was really struggling with. Um, dry skin, you know, uh, weird and wonderful things, digestive disturbances, uh, mood disruptions, anxiety, unexplained anxiety coming out of the blue from nowhere. You've never had it before. You can't work out what on earth is happening to me, you know. Um, so, so affecting all of the body systems, if we think that hormones, you know, these are female hormones that are coursing through our veins and, uh, and there are receptors, estrogen receptors in all parts of our bodies, in the brain, uh, in the um, muscle tissue, in the bone. And I suppose that kind of brings me to where I am in terms of uh, therapists, because I am very keen that therapists appreciate the ramifications of these fluctuating hormones on um, the skeletal tissue, the, the, um, the bones, the muscles, uh, any collagenous tissue actually you know collagen synthesis is affected by these estrogen levels and um and so it it, it has wide ranging ramifications and certain musculoskeletal conditions are uh predis were predisposed to uh, frozen shoulder say for instance shoulder pain uh, is <clears throat> shoulder pain is commonly uh, influenced by these fluctuating, fluctuating female hormones. And so, you know, it's not necessarily something that would be on your radar as a, as a, a therapist. And, and even for the woman in your care, you know, it may well not be on their radar that they're not realizing that these fluctuations are occurring uh, because we have this notion that, you know, menopause hits us one day and, uh, you know, and that's, then it's the end, I guess, you know, that is another beginning. If you want to think of that, the beginning of, of the rest of your, uh, life. But, um, you know, for me, I, I felt like I was underserved as a therapist in not having been a little bit more aware of all of these ramifications. So it caught you by surprise? Uh, well, well, yes, it caught me by surprise because I was 45 when I started to experience symptoms and that wasn't really what I was anticipating. 
And, um, you know, like you say, I, I didn't have a hot flush. I was struggling with insomnia. You know, that's not something that you and would you necessarily... Never, and you never had experience suffering from insomnia? Well, then? yeah. So interestingly, the evidence is that if you have had experiences of insomnia... Uh, earlier on in your life, then you're more likely to struggle with it around that time of menopause. And that was my experience. Um, you know, a, a life changing experience when I was a young uh, teenager, losing my brother in a motorbike accident meant that I, I struggled to, uh, you know, for a period of time with mental health uh, issues, depression, anxiety, and those kinds of things. And at that time, my uh, insomnia was something that was born, if you like. How old were you then? I was 17. And at that age, did you were you in a place where you were aware of these um, things that were happening to you, like anxiety, like insomnia? Or so did you? You're you're you're, not, you're saying no, but did you? Did you look for solutions then? Do you think experiencing... Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. So movement has always been my solution, actually. So you always felt like movement helped you personally? Yes, always, without a shadow of a doubt. Did you know that you were going to uh, be trained as a physiotherapist? Uh, well, at 17, I w it was on my list of uh, courses that I was looking to study. I was studying my A-levels. And uh, and yes, yeah, that was that was my path. And um, uh, uh, and I embarked on that path uh, without hesitation. You know, when I was 18, I graduated, completed my A-level studies rather, and uh, and set on my journey to uh, to become a physiotherapist. And you've um, you've you've lived in many places in the world, right? The first time I met you, you told me how uh, well traveled you are. <laughs> well, uh, so where have you lived? Well. I mean, we've lived around the United Kingdom, different places, Scotland um, and uh, and the south of England. And then I'm from the northwest. You may or may not be able to tell. Um, and then Cyprus was a place that I had a whale of a time for a couple of years. And then Colorado in uh, the United States. So that's when you mentioned when you came back from the States, you started yes, experiencing right. some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some symptoms. Was right. How's Colorado? Oh, my God. <laughs> where in Colorado? Well, we were in Colorado Springs mm. and um, uh, uh, Colorado, the healthiest state in the United States. So I was very at home there. <laughs> um, you they, know. Uh, there's a term mm -hmm. which might be uh, derogatory, um, but they call them granola. Gran oh, really? Have you heard that before? No, I haven't. Actually. Granola people <laughs> hike that are healthy, pretty much. <laughs> people that take care of themselves, uh, yeah, they go, yeah. they uh, refer to as granola people. But yeah, so you felt in good company there. Yeah, yeah, it was my spiritual home. Uh, the hiking in the mountains, mountain biking, horse riding. Uh, yeah, I, I, I swimming outdoors, you know, being able to be warm enough in the summer that you can swim outdoors. Amazing. Yeah. And did you practice uh, phys physiotherapy in these countries that you lived in, Cyprus and uh, the US? Yeah, well, in Cyprus, I was the uh, physiotherapist to the uh, Royal Air Force Akrotiri rugby team <laughs> for two years. Uh, that was a volunteer position. And, uh, and so, yeah, weekends, I'd be out there on the sidelines, taping the ears back on and such like. <laughs> was that your first experience working with athletes? Um, yes, I think it was probably. Yeah. Um, you know, we would, uh, I, I was in the training room. Uh, I was, uh, you know, putting them together midweek, putting them back together uh, helping them with the preparations, although there was still quite a lot of drinking involved in that. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, strapping, you know, before they went on the pitch, I did a lot of strapping. And uh, yeah, I, I think the opportunities that I've had f from that came about because of me moving around, uh, you know, have have really allowed me to explore things that I otherwise would never have done. So circling back, actually, to your mm. teenage years. Oh, yes. Um, and <clears throat> like, what um, what led you to discover personally movement as a therapy for you at a young age? 
Well, it was a family habit. So did I? I, th- I read yeah. on one of your bios that your family was in the top ten fittest <laughs> yeah. British families, or something of the sort. <laughs> well, it was a competition run by a, a magazine called Athletics Weekly, or Runners World, or one of those uh, magazines that my uh, my dad decided it would be good for us all to enter as a family. And uh, yes, uh, I think I was. T- I, we did it two years running. And uh, and we were tenth both times, but um, I was twelve and thirteen around the times when we were doing those uh, competitions. So my dad was the one who introduced the whole family to uh, sporting pursuits, and it was athletics in particular that he was uh, particularly interested in. And um, it was just a lifestyle, you know, something that we did every Monday and Wednesday. Went to the track. And uh, and you were divided into your age group. So it was lovely. You know, parents are kind of a little bit of childcare as well. We would go off with the with the youths doing our training and uh, and then everybody would meet up and it was very sociable. And uh, and then, of course, you've got the competitions at the weekend, track meets in the summer, uh, cross country running in the winter. My least favorite thing, I have to confess. But, um, you know, it, it it gave you structure to your week, structure to your lives, uh, seasons, you know, there were seasons in sport. And it was really just something that I never uh, thought anything about. It was just something that we did as a family. My dad was quite fanatical about um, outdoor pursuits. You know, he had us cold water swimming before it was even a thing. Uh, you know, he built a kayak uh, it, it, it was it was just bonkers, really. We we did wild camping, you know, and this is back in the seventies before it, it, you know, everybody else was at it. Uh, my mum made a tent, believe it or not, on a sewing machine. So, yeah, we we uh, we were really just exploring lots of different opportunities, and uh, and and yeah, it was it was. Uh, you kind of had to be there, is all I'm going to say. Sounds, sounds fun. <laughs> it sounds really fun. Um, so you start practicing physiotherapy, and then what is your first reaction of like just being introduced to individuals with various problems all over their bodies? Um, was it like something that that struck you, that surprised you, that g- the general population did not know that maybe you've discovered already on yourself because you were so active throughout your youth? Not really. I, I mean, I was just a sponge. To be honest, Um, I knew that rehabilitation was something that I was uh, particularly keen to explore. So working with individuals that suffered an injury. Yeah, the the walking wounded, as I called them, you know. Uh, So so the idea that these people, they were not in pyjamas. They were, you know, they were up and about and uh, maybe they'd hurt themselves, had an injury or, uh, you know, some sort of rheumatological conditions, amputees, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, like I say, the walking wounded. And um, yeah, that that was my ever, for as long as I can think, that was the thing, the only thing that I wanted to be doing. So that was your focus yeah. then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so was that your focus until you started experiencing um, those menopause symptoms? Well, yes, musculoskeletal uh, physiotherapy is is all I ever did. I think I think the the living uh, in Colorado in particular was a time when I was not able to practice as a physiotherapist, and so that was when I really was delving into the Pilates uh, side of the house. And uh, and I encountered for the first time in my life a Pilates reformer machine, which was just, you know, is what I think the most fantastic rehabilitation tool that you, that you could encounter, to be perfectly honest. It's very trendy right now. Oh, it is, isn't it? It's very yeah. trendy. Um, where I live in Tel Aviv, mm. um, it's the most expensive workout yeah. Um, that you can do, um, and toughest one to find an open slot. Oh, really? To position yourself in, yeah. So I actually never tried it myself, but you're saying that it's the best rehabilitation system. Yeah. Well, in actual fact, Joseph Pilates, you know, he was a person, and uh, and he came, he kind of uh, invented, built, engineered one of these uh, machines, these machines to work with people who had. Uh, suffered injuries and illness. So um, Pilates, the mat work actually came after 
the reformer work initially. Okay, so I did, did not know mm. that. So first the reformer yeah. started as a practice and yeah. only then the Matt Pilates developed. Well, in, in as much as he, he viewed that as a progression. So uh, Joseph Pilates, you may not know that he was interned in the Isle of Man. So he, he spent some time over here in the United Kingdom. And uh, whilst he was there, he was uh, working in the infirmary, helping to, uh, you know, helping his fellow camp, uh, campmates. And he would attach bed springs uh, to the beds to allow them to exercise because, uh, you know, he he had e experienced lots of different modes of exercise. He was a boxer, he taught self-defense, uh, he'd done yoga and uh, and lots of other different movement practices. And, and so he kind of, I think, almost think this is where the idea of the reformer spring resistance was born. Um, and then he came up with the moving platform, which is the uh, the integral part that that really makes it a Pilates reformer is the moving platform. So in Colorado is where you started mm. practicing with the reformer. Yeah, I'd no, I hadn't met one till I went to Colorado, and uh, you know there were half a dozen studios filled with these machines, and uh, and so yes, I did I did my first certification on the reformer in Colorado, and then I had, came back to the United Kingdom and I had to do it all over again, which you know was fine. <laughs> what is it maybe what is it um that's so unique about it though like what am i missing something in my um in my m weekly movement that i'm not getting by not practicing on a reformer well I, I mean the moving platform is is the one thing that you won't be getting anywhere else uh unless i guess you stand on a bosu maybe an upturned BOSU. Uh, Which is uh, very advanced, I guess. I, well, qu quite, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's very advanced. It's not accessible to people who, until they're much further through the rehabilitation journey. So, um, you know, and the fact that we can have people lying down and offer resistance, um, you know, a bit like a leg press machine, so that it's uh, a part of the body weight, a portion of the body weight, not the whole body weight. So we can we can offer um, resistance that is challenging uh, and equally we can offer resistance that is supporting uh, the limbs, the weight of the limbs. So um, yeah, are you missing something? Yes, is the answer to that. Um, I would heartily recommend you, you, you might find this is your next big thing. <laughs> it's something I will try. Uh, but you see, you're saying that it, it does, like it's the machine that just makes, um, makes it accessible, a certain type of movement. Yes. Resistance, yeah. So we can make it accessible to people who are needing rehabilitation, but equally we can make it really, really hard and advanced. And do you teach Matt Pilates as well? Yes. Yeah. And what's your opinion about Pil Matt Pilates? Um, well, I guess Pilates does come under some sort of scrutiny because uh, of, of uh, being criticised for maybe not being as functional as it might be. But then, you know, it, it really depends on what you're doing, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, so uh, exercising flat on your back may not be the most functional thing that you can do, but every day we've all got to get up out of bed, haven't we? You know, and for, for you know, in, in this modern life, uh, what we call ground dwelling, you know, is, is moving towards extinction. And so is the skill that goes along with that, if we're not careful. So, you know, the ability for us to get on and off the ground uh, maybe we need to spend a bit of time on the ground in the first place. So uh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> because th that is a um, it's a common health strength test, right? Mm. For someone to get off the ground easily, yeah, yeah, and then also getting off the ground without using, yeah, your without using your yeah. hands. Well, I don't know how common it is, but it's it's definitely something that um, a, a study was done. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I think he's called Arjo, A-R-J-O. I think he's Spanish. Uh, I, I am in touch with him on Twitter as it happens. And um, and yes, I, I've got a whole YouTube list of movements that you can do, 25 movements that will help to 
um, for you to master the ability to get on and off the ground without using your hands. And it is a predictor uh, of longevity, essentially. Are there any other major predictors of longevity that you subscribe to or push on to um, mm, your student? Yeah, better balance. So I know also a lot of your exercises mm. are one-legged exercises I've seen um, and focusing on balance. Um, and it's something that also I practice a lot and try and do. And obviously yoga incorporates a lot of that. And then only when you need to hold yourself on one leg for like 10 breaths, you realize how... Uh, well, actually how, hard it is. How really hard it is. Yeah. And then someone tells you that your your hips are not parallel to the ground and your hips are not even so you try and balance that out and then you realize that you really can't hold your balance on one foot um because we do make all these body function tweaks oh, to make yes. it as easy as possible for us to stand on one leg so when someone corrects us to the right way you're supposed to be uh, balancing then it's, it is very difficult yeah well that's right and of course uh, there's lots of body systems that contribute to our ability to balance you know the musculoskeletal system is is one of those and the vestibular system, uh, you know, the balance mechanisms in our So what ears. is the vestibular system? Well, it's the little canals that, that are in your ears, uh, the semi semicircular canals and, uh, uh, you know, and those are fluid filled and, and the, um, they contribute, they send signals to the brain that basically help us to know, orientate ourselves in space. So we know where we are in space and, you know, <clears throat> not not to put a downer on the situation, but all of these structures, uh, you know, they're as old as we are. And uh, and so the, the fluid in the canals becomes more viscous with age. Uh, there's actually a, a joint in the canals. The stirrup is, is one of the bones and there's an articulation and that joint moves in the fluid. The, the joint moves around to give us this joint position sense. And that's a joint like any other, you know, it gets stiffer as we get older. And so these kinds of things contribute to us um, having feel, feeling dizzier than we used to do, you know, uh, and dizziness is a, another symptom associated with menopause. So, uh, and, and balance difficulties. So we need to train all of these different systems uh, you know, the uh, the sensory system is the other system. And of course, vision is uh, is one of the things that really helps us to orientate ourselves. Um, and so, you know, this is these all these things, uh, the body systems working together are the things that I consider when I am prescribing my programs, whether it's to a group or to an individual. Um, and so, you know, moving your eyes in your head is something that can contribute to your ability to balance. Uh, you know, in yoga, we're quite keen often, you know, fix on a spot. Well, you or look at the third eye. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, yes, yes, that's right. Um, but actually, what if you move your eyes around in your head while you stood on one leg? You'll find that's a whole lot harder. Harder. Mm. Okay. So what, closing your eyes and then... Well, closing your eyes, uh, of course, that's, that uh, eliminates one source of information. And so, yes, closing your eyes would make it much harder. But moving, just moving your eyes, scanning your eyes from side to side, scanning your eyes up and down that is going to add a layer of challenge, a layer of difficulty. And then if you close your eyes, that's a whole nother level of difficulty. So you recommend women that are experiencing or going through menopause and experiencing um, even severe symptoms um, to pursue movement? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing we're talking, if we're talking specifically about balance, um, what we find as we age is that we start to feel less steady generally. Um, uh, we're processing, movement processing is affected. Our ability to process lots of different sources of information becomes impaired and, and, and more difficult. We're slower generally at doing these things. But you know, one thing that prevents or slows that decline is practicing these things. So it's really counterintuitive if you feel dizzy to do something that's going to bring on that symptom. However, 
you know, if you don't do that and you avoid that sensation, then the chances are that over time it will take less and less and less to bring on that symptom. So it's it's exposure therapy, essentially. And, you know, we know exposure therapy, just in the broadest sense, works on uh, lots of body systems. So muscles get bigger and stronger because we overstress them, you know, and it's the same with all our body systems, really, the circulatory system, the neurological system, none of these systems... Um, a, a difference in that regard. They all respond to uh, being put under a degree of stress. And so our job as therapists is to kind of um, to work out what level of stress we need to expose people to, uh, you know, whether it's strengthening muscles, bones, helping people to balance, uh, regaining movement after an injury, you know, whatever it is. We're navigating a path with people back to uh, a, a restorative path. And then, of course, with people that are with an aging population, we're navigating a path to prevent decline. Is in, your, in, in your experience, mm -hmm. you, you recommend, though, um, a, do you recommend a specific exercise, a specific form of movement um, for women that are experiencing menopause, but also for the ones that are, the 25% that are experiencing what we, you said, severe yeah, yeah. symptoms? Well, there is not one symptom of menopause that doesn't yeah. respond to moving. And, uh, and so my approach is to, to tackle the, the main issues. One is uh, declining strength of muscle and bone. Uh, the other, the balance is so important because, you know what, if we don't fall over, we're less likely to have a fracture. <laughs> so, you know, it's quite important to avoid falling over if we can. Uh, posture and alignment, you know, that's uh, one of the core Pilates principles is the way in which we align our bodies uh, contributes to our ability to function and perform. And although, you know, posture comes under a lot of criticism, uh, posture is dynamic, posture is not just standing still, uh, but actually the way in which we align uh, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor can impact their ability to function and perform. So, you know, th there is a place for this and, uh, and we certainly don't want to um, end up bent over double, you know, in our older age. We want to be able to stand up straight uh, for respiratory function, uh, for you know, for lots of different reasons, and so uh, those three key elements, and then of course the other is uh, pelvic health, uh, which is something that as a musculoskeletal therapist, I've I've kind of come to a bit later in my career, this appreciation of the uh, the importance of, uh, of of shining a light really on pelvic health and. Uh, and how the systems, you know, again, the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, they and the um, the deep core musculature, they all work together to maintain what is a pressurized system. And so, uh, you know, we can't just talk about the cylinder, the walls of the cylinder. We've got to consider the the ceiling and the floor. And so, um, you know, I, I am incorporating that a lot more into the work that I do. But for a woman experiencing menopause symptoms, mm. um, should she pursue other forms of activities? Maybe more, for example, like should uh, should she be running? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the the thing is, people have to do what they enjoy because if they don't enjoy it, then they're less likely to do it. Um, and we do need, I'm a big fan of cross training. You know, I, I talked about mountain biking and horse riding and skiing, maybe not, but, you know, all of these different activities bring something to our lives. Um, cardiovascular output, it's important for us to do some form of cardiovascular activity or to, to be able to drive the cardiovascular system. And, and there's different ways of driving the system. You know, you mentioned the vinyasa yoga that will increase your heart rate and and it will make you potentially make you sweat and uh, red in the face <laughs> and increase the respiratory rate. So 
you know, we're driving the cardiovascular system when we do things like that. But uh, for people that, you know, simply want to go out and walk more, then, you know, do that. Uh, I, I, I am of the opinion that we need to incorporate cardiovascular training, strength training and mobility into our lives. And, and so, you know, for me, Pilates and my Pilates, the way I teach Pilates and yoga, I incorporate strength, a, a focus, a big focus on strength, particularly for women. We need to strengthen, build muscle. Muscle is an organ, you know, it synthesizes hormones and, uh, and muscle building muscle releases, uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is, uh, helps us with our neuro generation, our neuro regeneration. And so, uh, brain health, it's really important for brain health. So, uh, if I, if there was one thing that I would say to women, it is be strong you know, that is the one thing that I would recommend by the same token. And aesthetically, sometimes yes. it's, uh, there's a, st you know, a stereotype of being strong mm -hmm. means beefy and not so attractive. Um, so yeah, but yeah. strong is important. Yeah. Yeah. Strong is really. And strong is not big muscles. No. Strong is many things. Yeah. Um, especially when you start going to yoga classes. Yeah. Um, you realize you've been in the gym your whole life and you think you're strong, but then there's people that you would not, you wouldn't categorize them and strong just by the way they look maybe, mm. but then now they can do a one arm handstand. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's a very humbling experience seeing people do these different things that you couldn't even imagine doing or the people that you surround yourself with, who you always thought were the strongest people, you know, couldn't even think about doing. No. I mean, there is a skill element as well that you, we, we haven't got to forget. You know, it's not just about brute strength doing something like a single armed handstand. There is a skill element and uh, and a practice, you know, that, that idea that practice uh, makes for improvement. Uh, you're not going to, I mean, people maybe really strong people could just throw a, a one-handed handstand. But, Probably not, yeah. But, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but by um, honing the, these yeah. skills, yeah. obviously a one, one hand on a handstand is a bit <laughs> extreme. extreme. <laughs> yeah, um, not very accessible. No. But honing skills mm. of that form yeah. will help you develop strength and yeah. understanding how your body works and how to yeah. use your body maybe in the best way possible to avoid things like falling down, yeah, yeah. to avoid things like a bad posture. Yeah of the sorts. But so I'll reframe my original question okay. there. I'm uh, sorry to hang on That's that okay. topic, but so is there a certain type of movement though that you would recommend women to avoid while going through this stage of life? Well, so the challenge is to navigate a path to moving more without hurting yourself. So uh, the, the danger is that we sort of get hoodwinked into thinking that we should be doing certain things. And of course, uh, you know, social media is filled with um, these messages and uh, and videos of how to lift heavy weights and how to, um, you know, and some of it is good uh, and some of it is less good. Uh, and none of it is tailored to you as an individual if you haven't had, uh, a, you know, an interaction with that with that teacher. So the danger is that, you know, we see people, especially in January, it's January, it's a new year, new me, you know, all of that. The resolution. Yeah, exactly. And we see people all the time. This is great business for the physiotherapy industry because people go out there throw themselves into something and, uh, and, you know, invariably they're in danger of hurting themselves. And that's the thing that I really would uh, want to, to encourage people to consider that it is as much about the way that we move as the movements that we, uh, that we make. And so, you know, the lifting weights is great. I lift weights myself, but I have really good form. <laughs> and I've been doing it for a long time and um, I'm less likely to hurt myself doing it because of that. So, so embrace something, get strong, find something that you think might help you, uh, you know, yoga strong, Pilates strong, uh, whether it's gym strong, you know, whatever kind of strong it is, but get some guidance so that 
uh, we can eliminate or reduce your risks of hurting yourself. Um, you know, tendinopathies are something that are characteristic of this middle life time. And that's because our collagen is just not as resilient as it, as it was once. And so uh, impingement at the shoulder is much more common because the subacromial space, maybe we've done things, uh, the bursa might be a bit thickened and we're more subject to impingement in the shoulder, but we're not knowing that. So, you know, what we do know about uh, our bodies, our brains, is that uh, there is a level of decline that occurs that we do not perceive. And so, um, because it's so incremental. Well, the, there's that. Yes, it is so incremental, and uh, and so we do not perceive it. And you know what? In my head, I, I look in the mirror. It's a different story. But in my head, you know, I, I could still be tw in my twenties doing all those things I did then. But uh, throw a cartwheel. I might not be quite as good as I used to be, and I may just hurt myself. You know, so. Um, so just to be cognizant of the fact that um, they're moving in a particular way, so we can move in a way that will increase the subacromial space. If we think about where the scapula are orientated on the back of us, then we're more likely to have uh, more space in this area underneath the acromion. And, uh, and so when we're doing our um, overhead weight lifting, we're less likely to impinge on the bursa, et cetera. So, um, you know, whereas without that guidance, people are, are more uh, taking more risks. And uh, what, you know, what you said about our body's abilities to move in, uh, to adapt, to compensate, to accommodate, all of this is totally subconscious. We're, we're not doing any of it on purpose. It's our body's strive to be as efficient as it possibly can be, energy efficient, that is. And so, you know, I mean, half the time we don't, we're not even aware of what we're doing. But then that's why we have to tackle it with being aware yeah. of yeah, yeah. having the correct yeah. technique, correct alignment, yeah. correct everything. So that mindful approach to movement. And that's what I love about yoga and Pilates. They both are very much mindful approaches to movement. And so that is a skill as well in and of itself. You know, the ability to tune in to how our bodies feel when we do certain things we're out of our bodies so much of the time uh, that we are totally unaware and so this this is a skill that we can learn and benefit from and then it translates into other areas of our lives and um and so you know that that mindful approach to movement whatever it is yeah and you can take it don't forget to drink oh, by okay. the way i'll give you a chance <laughs> thank you um so so for women in the teens, 20s, 30s, who are active, are athletic, are strong. Are there any other measures that they can be taking, should be taking um, to maybe, you know, um, to maybe assure that they'll hopefully be in that 75% of uh, women who experience uh, menopause symptoms uh -huh. or going through some, and not yeah, be in that 25% yeah, yeah. nutrition or other elements that come in? Supplementation? Well, yeah, I mean, there are some predictors, uh, family sort of history can give us an indicator. So people can also be uh, prepared. Predisposed, yes. Predisposed yeah. and prepared because yeah, yeah, of yeah. that, yeah. So be prepared uh, is, the, is the thing. W to mitigate the symptoms, to prevent um, the hormonal, you know, for you to be, I think, metabolic health is something that we would uh, consider. And, um, you know, what What I heard is that 50% of the population might be pre-diabetic. Uh, you know, these changes in our bodies that are happening, bubbling away under the surface, building up, that it's only when they get to a certain threshold that you become symptomatic, say, for instance. So for us to look after our metabolic health, um, will invariably help with this, uh, the, the, how we handle hormones, if you like. And so, uh, you know, for me, it really is about embracing a holistic approach to being healthy. And, um, and so, yes, 
Uh, sugar, in my opinion, is something that we should avoid uh, from a metabolic point of view. Um, I think uh, I, I definitely read that, um, you know, shoulder pain, two contributing factors. One is your hormonal health, your your whether you're female, where you are in your hormonal uh, situation. And two was um, that the, it's much more common in someone who is pre-diabetic. So, you know, to, uh, to, and all of these things so interconnected, you know, the yep. mind, body, spirit, uh, the gut health, the, um, the brain health. Uh, the one thing, I think the one thing for me that, that really has come to me later that, that, you know, I hope, uh, is coming to other therapists sooner in the journey, you know, is, is this idea of, um, uh, self-efficacy, you know, the idea that people, the, the amount of control that people feel they have over their own health is really important. So that we as therapists are giving them that opportunity to, to experience control, if you like, uh, the, the ability to create a shift, whether it's to, um, to decrease pain, to make somebody, uh, to help them feel, be stronger, to help them to have more range of movement. Uh, and for them to feel like that's something they had a part in, you know, um, and so to empower people to feel like they are the architect of their own health. Um, you know, preventative medicine is really my, uh, happy place. I, uh, it's something that I've practiced for myself and my own family, um, you know, t to, to, to move well, to move more, to eat well. Uh, and, and the mind management piece of the puzzle is really very, very important for us to be cognizant of as therapists and, and people. Because everyone can drive this bus of health, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, obviously you can be uh, smacked in the face with surprises that you have no control over. Mm. Um, but even then you have control over what you do the next day and the next day, how you move, what you move, what you put in your mouth, what you look at and all these small measures that mm. probably, as you mentioned, affect really all the systems of the body. Mm. Pregnancy. Ooh. Yeah, I know. An, an interesting one. Also <laughs> something I haven't experienced yet. Um, but is it um, also like movement? Is it recommended for a woman who is pregnant? Well, so the guidance is that if you were active before you got pregnant, then carry on being active. If you are not, then approach it with caution, you know, so that you, that's not to say don't do it, but... Um, you know, accessible things like just 10,000 steps a day. If you wanted to use an arbitrary figure, um, uh, some gentle yoga practices and just work with somebody who, who is familiar with the, the pregnant woman's body. Do you what, work with pregnant women? Not particularly. No, it isn't. I mean, I've had two children, so I am familiar with what happens. <laughs> uh, and I did exercise the whole way through. Uh, both my pregnancies, but um, at the time I was running quite a lot. And so I think from about 12 weeks, I just elected that the running could wait and I would, uh, and I would do more walking. But there are, there are lots of people out there who do specialize in, in pregnant women. And I think uh, in helping pregnant women. And I think, you know, the thing that I, I kind of feel is that this is often a time when people who previously have been active kind of start to fall off the wagon a little bit because opportunities, uh, you know, when you've got a little one to look after, it can be really challenging to fit this stuff in and around your life. And, you know, we had to get really imaginative as a family to for us to be able to do this. My my husband, you know, is also a keen outdoorsman and uh, uh, footballer, actually. Well, that's more in your field, isn't yes. it? Yes. Which team does he support? Oh, gosh. I, I don't say Manchester United, but... Yay. Oh, good. There we are. <laughs> um, you know, so we, we got imaginative. Uh, the, the bike seat, the, the, the baby carrying devices, then to the bike seat, and then we get them on 
uh, a, you know, in the trailer that you can drag along behind your bicycle. And, uh, and then as soon as they could take a, ride a scooter or a bicycle, then we could jog alongside them. And, and, you know, so, and actually it's now in their DNA. So this thing that my dad started, you know, it, uh, put into my DNA is now in their DNA. And, and I, I, you know, this is how these things begin. Yeah. And, uh, and it starts with you, uh, but you can pass it on. It's kind of contagious to the people around you, friends, family members. Do you still run? Do I still run? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, do you know what? I'm kind of semi-retired from running. Uh, semi? What does semi mean? Well, it means that I, I, in my circuit training every Saturday morning, there's usually some running up and down the gym to be had. Um, and when I do, uh, I do a class on a Monday morning usually, which is... Um, jumping up and down on a step and, you know, those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, it is actually really important because um, the, the elastic recoil of the muscles for us to move quickly, uh, you know, that's something as well that declines if we're not careful, uh, the muscle mass, the strength, but also the res responsiveness uh, of our, our muscles. And that's a, neuro a neurological and, and a muscular sort of thing that happens. So, you know, to keep practicing skills that require us to uh, to respond quickly, uh, and so yes, I, I throw a bit of running in, but I'm, I mean, I used to run five or six days a week, not far, but you know, yeah. I would do it every day, and now it's a couple of times a week, I guess. Yeah, I'm only asking because um, from a maybe mental health mm, perspective, yeah, um, I just for me at least, mm. you know, I've always found that running. I still dread it every time before, before. I before mm. going out for the run, which I think yeah. people won't believe me because people that see me run probably think, "Oh, it's so easy for him to go run. It's so uh, it's so uh, second nature." <laughs> uh, but it's not because I look mm. for every single excuse I have in my uh, back pocket not to go running that day. Um, but oh, it's always the after mm. that you feel so yeah, like, yeah. and different from yoga. I think a, a, for me at least, a complete different. Um, complete different uh feeling whereas in yoga mm. i feel more rejuvenated mm. energized mm. um almost like a very good night of sleep waking up energ energized which doesn't really happen that often no um but after a yoga session i do feel that and after a run it's almost like a, a sense of mission accomplished fulfillment mm. like almost like no other well it, it is a probably a different set of biochemistry that's going on there um, and our natural uh, cannabinoids is something that we get when we run, uh, endogenous cannabinoids. And that's, you know, a substance, again, that um, changes our brain chemistry. Uh, I, I actually, what I didn't say was I do spinning. So high intensity, high intensity, whether it's running uh, on a spinning bike, uh, for some people swimming, if they've got a good enough technique that they can, you know, get enough intensity into the swimming, those kinds of things, um, you know, then you are going to be able to tap into that biochemistry. And for me, running was the thing that really helped me with my brain chemistry at time, at difficult times. So, uh, so yeah, all the, but you know, it's, it, for me, it is, you know, people, I, I have friends who are runners and run marathons and ultra marathons, and there's really not a lot of other time in that for, uh, for the cross training that, that I really would favor, yeah. you know, the strength, the, the mobility and the, uh, the high intensity sort of interval type stuff. Because I mean, you know, if you're running marathons, especially mm. ultra marathons, mm. you are actually, you are... <laughs> again, for a great sense of achievement and accomplishment. Mm. Um, and it's amazing what people do, but you are giving up yeah. on some other, other things and you are causing health damage in certain areas yeah, by yeah. pursuing those yeah, things. Yeah. Potentially, yes. Pot yeah, potentially. Mm. Um, breathing. <gasps> breathing. And I saw it's also, I think there's, you have a list of books that you recommend. Um, and one of yeah. them is titled Breathing. In Pilates, I was introduced for the first time to a, I haven't done much Pilates, but one of the things I remember was like breathing to the lungs, to the core. Okay. So 
breathing is quite topical, isn't it, at the moment? Uh, you know, yeah, at the mo I know at the moment <laughs> and for the last tens of thousands of years. Well, it's kind of essential, yeah, isn't we, it? It's we, essential to life, but. Um, but it is. It's 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 yeah. something that is um it's trending. Conscious. But it's also not trending now. From yeah. I think like it's resurfacing where people want to find out how do we do it better. Yeah. Um. Right. I might have said this before in a done other podcast, but a a quote that I heard once that has stuck with me now for many years is like we breathe to survive, not to thrive. Mm. Um. So like there's ways for us to breathe more efficiently to help us. Yes, that's right. And, uh, you know, a significant portion of the population will have dysfunctional breathing patterns and not know it. So uh, breathing speaks to the mood and, uh, and the, bre uh, you know, uh, the psyche quite a lot. It also speaks to the pelvic floor, uh, you know, the cylinder that we were talking about before, the floor and the ceiling, they, they have synergies with one another. Um, if we think about the myofascial connections, the sole of the foot, uh, we've got connections that travel through the pelvic floor all the way to the diaphragm uh, and to, to the back of the heart, actually. So, you know, the, the, we can't separate this stuff out is the thing. And, uh, and so breathing um, optimally for oxygenation, if we think that the... Um, the circulation, the uh, the blood is pooling at the bases of the lungs. And so you get the best oxygen exchange when the air is all the way at the bases of your lungs. So because of gravity, the blood is pooling more around the bases of the lungs. And so we have to get the air to the bases of the lungs. And in order to get the air to the bases of the lungs, we have to harness the action of the diaphragm. The diaphragm attaches to the margins of the rib cage, the lower margins of the rib cage. And so if we want to access the diaphragm, we need to move the rib cage. And, uh, and so essentially that, uh, that is it. We access the diaphragm. We take the air to the bases of the lungs. Uh, what we know is nasal breathing is more likely to access the diaphragm. And so breathing in and out through the nostrils is something that we're starting to hear more about. It also cleans the air, moistens the air, filters the air, you know, so it, it is the way yeah. that we're in intended to breathe. Joseph Pilates taught a method of breathing, which is a rib cage expansion. So, you know, like I said, the rib cage expansion speaks to the diaphragm. But rib cage expansion without expanding your chest? Well, so no, because it's all one thing, isn't it? But what we, what he wants specific, what we want specifically to do is expand the bottom part of the rib cage, so that it's possible to breathe apically at the top of the lungs, and to have very little excursion of the diaphragm and very little movement of the rib cage. So when you are going about your day, you're sitting at the computer. Deep breathing is not necessarily called for, is it? We're not, we, we don't have that drive to- Not breathe. even thinking about it. Well, we're definitely not thinking about it. No, quite. Um, and so, you know, f in our modern life, levels of activity are, are, are less. And so it may be that you could go through a whole week of never actually- being called upon to breathe deeply. If we get, you know, I lived in America, the car is in the garage, you go from the kitchen to the car, you open the garage door, you drive out, you know, you, you don't see people walking on the streets. I had visitors come to see me and they said, where are all the people? Because they're in the cars, you know, they're, ne they're never on foot anywhere. Um, uh, the infrastructure isn't really intended for that. So, um, you live there, you you will maybe know what I'm talking about. I know exactly, yeah. So, uh, you know, we could get through a whole week of never needing to breathe deeply. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the breathing drives the metabolism, metabolism drives the breathing. It's all got this uh, feedback loop where everything, you know, works both ways so that we can, uh, we can practice breathing techniques which will change our biochemistry, change how we feel. Um, and also 
uh, condition structures, you know, that the way in which the pelvic floor and the diaphragm work together, breathing practices can help to condition the pelvic floor. So, uh, you know, it's, it is something that I'm getting increasingly interested in and, and probably yoga has helped me with that because of course in yoga, we've got lots of different deep breathing practices. And so you've got short, rapid breathing, um, the, um, breath of fire, say for instance, um, you've got an, and, and, um, yoga incorporates much more of breath holding, so that uh, we're, we're, you know, it, it's like any system. We can train it, and uh, and and it has benefits physiologically, uh, emotionally t- to do that. And so um, I can't even remember where we began this conversation with, with the book that you recommend, <laughs> and, and the fact that I I tackled like um, lower lung breathing mm-hmm. for the first time really in a Pilates class. So mm-hmm. just something uh, also yeah. stuck with me. And now that you mentioned like the the fact that people can go a week and probably way more mm. um, for a lot of people without expanding their lungs, without taking any deep mm. breaths is kind of scary. So I hope people are more mindful and conscious of this. Um, and I think it is a topic that is, again, I think it's getting more um attractive to at least talk about and mm. think about. And even now, just you talking about it now for a couple of minutes, I feel like I was breathing better yeah. while you were speaking about it. I was expanding my lungs just because I'm thinking about it. So it's very interesting. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, I know it goes by pretty fast. We'll definitely do this again. Um, but please tell people where they can find you. Obviously, you're on our, our website. We've made a couple of courses together and more. Um, but uh, yeah, please tell people where they can find you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm precision.co.uk and precision is spelt with a Z. I don't know why I ever thought of doing that, but you know, it kind of speaks to my values, which is how we move matters. And uh, moving with precision and control is something that uh, I'm very, very passionate about sharing with people. Philippa, thank you very much. Thank you. If you found this video useful and want to see more like this, make sure you subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification bell.